can we get if we sail a little bit high? isolated in a flood. As the waters rose, he prayed to God to deliver him. When the waters had come up to his steps, a man in a rowboat came by and said, can I help you? Can I take you somewhere? And he said, no, God will save me. And the waters continued to rise, and they rose to the first floor, and two men in a motorboat, motorboat came by, and they said, can we help you? Can we take you somewhere? And the man said, no, God is going to save me. And then a helicopter came by because the water had risen and risen up to the roof and the man was sitting on top. And they said, can we help you? And sent down a rope ladder and he said, no, God is going to save me. Well, the man died in the flood and went to heaven. And when he got to the pearly gates, he asked the Lord, why didn't you save me? To which the Lord replied, I sent two boats and a helicopter. Often we look at the circumstances in our life and it's easy to forget that God's hand is always at work. But often God works in the ordinary, day-to-day -day things to accomplish his will. And we have a perfect example of that in the story of Esther. Will you pray with me? Holy God, as we open the book to the story of Esther. As we hear this amazing tale, I pray that you will help us to understand it, that you will help us to glean good. God, be present in this time, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, today I'm going to be preaching from the book of Esther, the whole book. It's ten chapters. I'm not going to read all of the ten chapters, but I am going to talk through all of the ten chapters. So you can have your books, Bibles open to Esther, but I'd encourage you to listen to the story. And this week, your homework is to read through this entire book. Okay, it's only ten chapters, it's easy to do, but today I just want you to listen as we talk about Esther. This book opens by describing the expansive kingdom of King, now it depends on what version you have. Anybody want to see, look at your verse, verse one, one, one. What kind of king do we have? Who says what? Anybody have King Ahasuerus? Okay, anybody have Xerxes? Okay, same person, so don't get confused. I'm going to use the name Xerxes today, but it's the same king that is being talked about. Okay, so here we have this expansive king, uh, kingdom of King Xerxes, which stretches from Ethiopia to the edges of India. Now picture a map. It's pretty big, right? All the way from modern Libya to Pakistan. This is a huge amount of space. Xerxes is the son of Darius, the grandson of Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great was the Persian ruler who decreed that the Jews could go back to their land after the 70 years of captivity. Now, we have talked a little bit about the Jews in captivity, right, over the last few months. So here we are post-exile. We are past that time. And that's how the book of Esther begins. Now, many Jews went back to Israel under the decree of Cyrus. They went back. They re rebuilt Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple the second temple, they reestablished themselves in the land, but there was a large number of Jewish people who had been exiled in Babylon who remained there. Now, we don't know why they remained there, but that is where we are. They settled, they scattered, they thrived, and they were all throughout this Persian empire of Xerxes. So we have many Jews who are still dispersed and live under the pagan rule and influence of Xerxes. And in this group of people, there's a young Jewish girl named Hadassah, also Esther, who was an orphan taken in and raised by her relative Mordecai, 
As a young woman, it says she was beautiful. And by all indications, not only beautiful, but also lovely in spirit. So there she was, living her life, raised and taught by her cousin Mordecai, and apparently going about her life in a very ordinary way. Now we come back to Xerxes, the king, who had a reputation for many things, but one of those things was holding great feasts and drinking parties, and he was holding a huge celebration after he won some major war. The, wa the wine was flowing, the king was in the mood to show off, so he sends for his queen, Vashti, intending to parade her around in front of those men present. Well, for whatever reason, Vashti didn't like that idea. And she refused to go. In that culture, it was not wise to disobey the command of your husband, let alone the command of the king. So she ref her refusal causes a stir. And Xerxes says, what if other women became, become, begin to behave this way? And we're not going to get into that today. <laughs> okay, we're not going there. But the king says, what if other women think this is okay behavior? They might all decide to ignore their husband's authority. And so Xerxes has a problem. And he talks to his advisors and he says, what should I do about this? And the response is unanimous. The king's advisors convince him to divorce Vashti, dethrone her as queen, and find a new queen before there's upheaval in the kingdom. So a command went out to all the beautiful young virgins of the kingdom. Now, this was millions of people probably in this kingdom. Okay? So the command goes out that they were to be brought into harems and prepared for Xerxes to be presented before him. And it says in the Bible, this is an interesting side note, has nothing to do with the sermon, that it is a 12-month process. Who knows what's happening? But in order to be prepared to go before the queen, king, they have to be prepared in this 12-month beautification process. Okay? So one of the many young women brought before Xerxes as a possibility for the new queen was Esther. Right. Esther. When she was prevent, presented to the king, he fell in love with her more than any of the other women, it says. So maybe he was in love with some other ones. We don't know. But it says he fell in love with her. Esther 2.17. See, now we're moving pretty quickly through. Esther 2.17. She obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the other women. So he set the royal crown upon her head, therefore making her queen. And so Esther becomes Xerxes' queen an obscure Jewish orphan, a child of exiled people, conquered people, is exalted to the highest position that a woman could have. This is not a coincidence. There is power at work underneath the surface, isn't there? So Esther's life was suddenly vastly different than she had probably ever imagined. After she became queen, her cousin Mordecai, who you assume, based on some of the things that are going on in this story, that he has some sort of position in the court. Mordecai overhears a plot to kill the king. Through Esther, he gets word to the king, and in Esther 2.23 it says this, When the affair was investigated and found to be so, both of the men who were plotting against the king were hanged on the gallows, and this was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. Now, when moving into chapter 3, we learn that there is a feud between Mordecai and a man named Haman, who had become the king's highest official. And Haman is a guy who is not a great guy. Pretty full of himself, pretty happy about his place as the second in command. Well, Mordecai, being a Jew, wouldn't bow down to Haman or give Haman the respect that Haman thought he deserved. And because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to Haman, Haman got super mad, right? And came up with this plan to have Mordecai killed. Now, let's do a side note. Does this sound familiar to some stuff we've discussed over the last few months? High and mighty fella, people of God refusing to bow to him, okay? 
Haman, however, now this is where it gets real interesting. Haman is not content to just take Mordecai out by himself. It says in the Bible, he considered it below him. So he comes up with this plan. The only way to avenge his honor and to assure that he would receive the respect that he felt he deserved was to arrange not just for the execution of Mordecai, but the execution of all of the Jews. Consulting advisors and casting lots, they decided the destruction of the Jews would take place in a date, at a date that was set for about 11 months past there. Now that is a long-term angry feud, isn't it? To be so mad at somebody that you're going to eradicate their entire people group. 11 months in the future. So that takes a lot of cruelty and planning. So do you get the idea that Haman is sort of super crazy? <laughs> It's not just rage, right? It's a controlled plan for genocide. Now, Haman has to convince the king of this. And so he goes to the king and he says, there is a certain people in your kingdom that have different laws than the rest of the people. They don't keep your laws, O king, and so they should be destroyed. Well, the king, anxious to eliminate any rebellion, agrees. And a decree written by Haman for the king went out. Now, do you remember what happens with decrees sent by the king? Can't be they can't be canceled. Okay, we learned that in the story of Daniel. They can't be canceled. Okay, so this decree went out. Every region was sent the message that on a specific day, 11 months in the future, the Jews would be wiped out, both young and old, women and men, children, their possessions plundered. The law was written and couldn't be taken back. Not even the king himself could call it off. Well, the Jews heard about the plot, of course. And when Murde Mordecai heard about the plot, chapter 4, 1 says, He tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, he cried out in a bitter cry. He lamented for his people, for himself. All of the empire and every province where the command was given, there was lamenting and mourning among the Jews, fasting, weeping, wailing, and in sash sackcloth and ashes. Now at the same time, we have Esther. At the command of Mordecai, she had not revealed her identity as a Jew. So as the cries go up and Mordecai stands outside the king's gate in sackcloth, Esther sends a servant to find out what's going on. She's sort of separated, right? Because she's in the palace. So she's sort of separated from what's going on. She doesn't know about this plot. And she knows that Mordecai is mourning, so she sends out a servant and says, tell me what is happening. So the servant goes out and asks Mordecai, and Mordecai said, tell Queen Esther to plead with the king and beg him to save her people. So the servant came back and told Esther, but Esther sent him back to Mordecai with these words, anyone who goes to see the king without being summoned will be put to death. That was a law in the land. Only if the king calls can you approach him. Without being sent for, I'd be in mortal danger. Only, the king ex only if the king extends his golden scepter as a sign that I am welcome will I live. Even I, the queen, have not been called for in 30 days. So the king has not wanted to hang out with Esther, for whatever reason, we don't know, the Bible doesn't say, in 30 days. And so Mordecai comes to her and says, my people, our people, our people are going to be killed, plead with the king. And what does Esther do? She, she says she can't. She's worried about herself. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later. But really, Esther, right? Isn't that kind of what you think? Like, come on, lady. Your entire people group is in, in danger here. And she sends word back to Mordecai and says, no, I can't do this because I'd be killed. So, this might be something how we would respond, maybe, right? Self-preservation. But Mordecai, when he heard Esther's response, said, according to chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, it says this, Do not think in your heart that you will escape the in the king's palace any more than the other Jews. If you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. 
Yet who knows what, why you have come into the kingdom, maybe for such a time as this. So in Mordecai's response, there's a little bit of a threat, right? God's ways are going to prevail, whether you help or not. And there's also a little bit of a maybe calling encouragement, right? You've been put there, Esther, for such a time as this. The message from Mordecai becomes a turning point in Esther's life. It makes it clear that if her Jewish bloodline were discovered, she would die as well. And he points out the fact that as queen, she might have some say in what's going to happen. Mordecai is confident that God would deliver Israel, with or without Esther. After all, God had saved the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God had saved Daniel. Mordecai's letter helped Esther to realize that for such a time as this, she was uniquely positioned to save the people of God. She had become queen through God's sovereign plan in order to save God's people. And so she made a choice. With every ounce in faith, of faith and bravery, Esther told Mordecai to go, gather the Jews, fast and pray on her behalf, because she was going to go and plead to the king. And here Esther declares at the end of chapter 4, and I love this, if I perish, I perish. At least she would be faithfully standing up for God and God's people. Now Esther knows that to appear before the king without being summoned, she risks her death. But this is a situation that warrants that risk. <coughs> And she's a woman of faith, so she dresses in her royal clothes and stands in the inner court where Xerxes can see her. And her faith and her courage were rewarded, right? Xerxes sees her, and maybe he's like, oh yeah, I like that lady, right? He holds out his golden scepter, which means she has an invitation to enter. And he, he says to her, Esther 5, 3, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Whatever it is, it will be given to you, even half of my kingdom. This guy must really like Esther, right? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a phrase that he repeats through the next few encounters with Esther. But then an interesting thing happens, right? Esther doesn't make a request. She simply invites the king and Haman to come to dinner that night. Now, why should, didn't she tell the king about the message? Why didn't she immediately ask for him to save the Jews. Hmm. Now there's a number of possible explanations, but I think despite all of those things, the reason that Esther puts it off, though she doesn't realize it, is because God still had some things to arrange before Lynn, the timing was right. Right? Her servants were fasting. So Esther seems to have done all the arranging but God is in it. Now, in any event, she invites the king and Haman. Now, you remember Haman is this mean guy, cruel man, who has created this plot against the Jews, self-serving. She's invited Haman and the king to join her for a banquet that she's prepared for them. So the king sends for Haman, and he hurries to join them, and you can imagine him thinking, of course I am going to have the presence of the king and the queen, right? Okay? Don't you just love this guy? As a character in this story, of course. He's just so self-absorbed that he doesn't seem to have a clue what is happening. So he leaves Esther's first banquets in high spirits, and again, at the banquet, now, you remember I said the king said, whatever you ask, I will give it to you up to, he said this at this first banquet, up to a half of my kingdom. But Esther still doesn't say anything. She invites them to dinner again the next night. So Haman, thinking that he's just, just in with the king and queen, right? He leaves, this, um, he leaves this meal in just a great mood. And then, now, have you ever been in a great mood and see somebody that you just can't stand? <laughs> he sees Mordecai. And his mood is ruined. He's in such a rage that he goes home... And now here we see him lose his temper, right? He's had this lengthy plan of 11 months to kill all the Jews, but he loses his temper, goes home, 
and begins to have gallows built to hang Mordecai, never thinking that anything could go wrong. But his false confidence was about to let him down, wasn't it? Because only divine sovereignty was happening in the midst of this. So that night, the king has insomnia. Ever have insomnia? What do you do for insomnia? What do you guys do? Read? Okay. I don't know what it is. Oh, it's when you can't sleep. Netflix, yeah. Supper. Supper? Supper. Oh, supper. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you guys ever have that thing where you, here I'm going off again, but that thing where you lay there and you're like, okay, if I go to sleep now, I can get five hours of sleep. If I go to sleep now, I can get four hours of sleep. You do that thing? Okay. Anyway, the king can't sleep. So he gets up and asks for, now somebody said read, and he reads something that I would consider boring. Okay, maybe he thinks it's great because it's talking about him and all his conquests, but he gets up and asks for a copy of the chronicles of his reign to be read to him. Now maybe he thought reading would calm him down and he could sleep, but anyway, as it's being read to him, there comes across this account of the time when Mordecai had foiled an assassination attempt against him. Do you remember that from the beginning of the story? And so the king says, what reward was given to Mordecai because he saved my life? And the servants say, nothing was done for him. And the king says, well, something needs to be done. And so now it is time, it's morning time, and he decides he wants to ask his highest counsel about advice. Who's his highest counsel? Okay. Haman, the bad guy, right? Okay. So Haman is walking by. He's waiting, actually, in the outer courts for the king to wake up so that he can go and tell him his plot to hang Mordecai. So Mordecai, or Haman comes in, and the king asks Haman in six, Esther 6.6, 6, What shall be done for a man whom the king wishes to honor? Now, right, exactly. <laughs> what does Haman do? He's like, oh. Well, who else could the king want to honor besides me? So, of course, the way that he responds to this is uh, in the way that he would want it to happen, right? Now, if only had Haman had listened to Dr. Phil, right? It's not about you. Okay. But Haman is thinking, ah, the king wants to honor me. What would I like? And so he says, for the man whom a king wishes to honor, let royal robes be brought which the king has worn, and a horse that the king has ridden, and a royal crown on his head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to the, one of the king's most noble office, officials. Let him robe the man whom the king wishes to honor, and let him conduct the man on horseback through the open square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus it shall be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. And the king says, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Do this for Mordecai. <laughs> and Haman, of course, is like, wait, what? <laughs> what is happening here? But he has to listen to the king. And so Haman goes and does all of these things for Mordecai and leads him through the city, open square, saying, thus it shall be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. Now, Haman, I bet, is totally humili humi humiliated. So he rushes home to tell his wife and his friends what's happened. In a snarky way, I'm sure. At this news, I think a light bulb goes off for Mordecai's wife, or for him and his wife, right? Mordecai is a Jew, a worshiper of the God of Israel. Haman has this plot against him, and you can just see Haman's wife going, this does not seem good. Haman is totally doomed, right? No one can stand up to someone like that, but it's too late, because the king's messenger arrives as they're talking and hurries him off to what? The queen's second banquet, right? So Haman thinks, okay, maybe I can be more in control of this situation. He goes to that second banquet. One of Haman's great failings is that wrath, that malice towards Mordecai. I think that it 
clouded his judgment. So here we have the king and Haman arriving at the banquet again, enjoying a glass of wine. When the king, <coughs> may I have a glass of water, please? Somebody, or a bottle? <coughs> <coughs> okay. Amazing. Okay, so they're enjoying a glass of wine. Thank you so much. The king asks Esther again, What can I do for you? I will give you anything, even up to half of my kingdom. So we are in Esther 7 now. And Esther replies, this time, finally, King, let my life be given to me. That is my petition. And the lives of my people. That is my request. Verse 4, 7, 4, We have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. Now imagine Haman sitting here listening to this. What's going through his head? He's been found out, right? He had not realized that Esther was one of the Jews that he'd sentenced to death. So I can imagine that he's terrified, and the king says, Who would do this to you? And Esther says, Well, yeah, Haman. So at this point, the king is in a great rage. He is mad. So much so that he walks out of the room into the garden to calm down before he decides what he's going to do with Haman. When he leaves, Haman sets the seal on his demise. He throws himself at Queen Esther's feet, begging for her to spare his life. But just at that moment, the king returns and finds him thrown across the couch where Esther is lying, and that's, of course, the last straw for the king. He says, will you even assault my queen? in my presence, in my own house. And the king has Haman arrested and hung on the gallows that he's just built for Mordecai. And that's the end of Haman. Esther is rewarded with all of Haman's possessions, which she then hands over to Mordecai to look after. Mordecai is promoted to the position that Haman himself had held. But there's still this problem, do you remember? Of the edict about the Jews. So Esther pleads with the king to revoke it, but you know that he can't. In Persia, once a law is made, it can't be revoked. So instead, the king allows Mordecai to write a second law, allowing the Jews to gather to defend themselves on an appointed day, on that appointed day. When the day comes, those who seek to attack them are all killed, and so the crisis ends, and so it is instituted, the Feast of Purim, that is celebrated by the Jewish people to this day. And that's our story. That's Esther, the book of Esther. Quite a woman. Quite a woman. <laughs> Quite, a woman. Quite a story. Now. I wonder if you think that pastors always love the Bible and the stories in the Bible. Do you wonder that? No. I don't. I don't like this story. I love the Old Testament. That's why I've been doing this. And as I was preparing this, I decided I wanted to preach on Esther. Now, I have not done a lot of study in Esther until this last few weeks. I don't like this story, and let me tell you why. I don't think that Esther and Mordecai are very great role models, and I kind of glossed over it as I told the story, but let me tell you this. She hid her identity as a Jew, which we're often told is not the way to function as a people of God, right? People are supposed to know who we are, that we're gods, that we belong to God, that we're Christians. She only decides to save her people when she realizes that she's also in danger. Right? So what's going on with that? She has the chance to intercede for Haman and forgive him. 
when he throws himself at her feet, but instead allows the king to kill him, and not only that, but then to kill many other people because of it. I don't know, I just struggle with this. And I thought I'd be honest with you, so that you don't go thinking, ah, pastors must just love everything in the Bible and it's easy for them to preach. That is not true. But, is there good in this story? When I was in seminary, when Brett and I were in seminary, we had a class with uh, Professor Gil Stafford, um, who is a theologian of the church. And he, you know, you get a syllabus when you're in college, you have all these books to read, and you assume, you assume, that the professors have given you the best of the best books for that class and for what's going on. So we'd been in the class, it was probably midway through the semester, and we start reading, we as a class, start reading this book that was given to us by Gil. And it is a terrible book. <laughs> Just terrible. And so we get to class and we say, we, you know, we start having discussion, because you have discussion about the books, and he just kind of lets us go on and on about how terrible this book is and why it doesn't, like, this doesn't make sense and this doesn't make sense and why did we even read this? And he said something that, you know, is tremendously important for all of us, which is, okay, but what was good in it? And there was kind of silence, you know, in the classroom. And Gil said, there can be good gleaned out of bad. There's always something to be learned, even if you learn what not to do. Esther is a book that is in the Bible, so it's there for a reason. So the question I had to ask myself is, okay, why is this here? Why is this story about a couple people who were not very great moral characters, who allowed just tons of people to die, and encouraged it, really. Why is this in the Bible? I'm going to get to that. But let me ask you a question. There's something very unique about the book of Esther. Do you know what it is? We're not perfect. And God can change our hearts. Yeah, but there's something about the book. Do you know that Esther is the only book in the Bible? that doesn't mention God. God's not in there. Look for it. In fact, you could lift this book right out of the scripture and it could be a history story. Because the only thing that ties it even to religion is the fact that the people who are going to be killed are the Jews who are God's people. Esther doesn't pray. Esther doesn't talk to God. God doesn't intervene with these miracles that we see throughout the rest of the Bible. God's name isn't even mentioned. Hmm. But, so I said, okay, what good can we glean from this? So we've got my personal opinion about the story. We've got the fact that God's not mentioned. I think that the absence of God in this story, the absence of the mention of God, because God is in the story. Fits perfectly with the theme of this book. Because the emphasis of Esther appears to be how God works in the ordinary, sort of through behind the scenes. The invisible hand of God is evident everywhere. The absence of God here in this book, I think, may be intentional. It's an ingenious strategy by the writer to draw the reader in to think deeply about how life's circumstances are ordered with divine purpose. Amen. There are not many coincidences in life. The things that happen in the story are not random. There is a designer, a coordinator, a power behind all of what happens. God if we look for God, is in all of the story. Now, there are no miracles in this book, but the whole process is a divine providence. People, places, time, action, 
all set into work because of God. Notice even the timing of Esther's birth and physical maturity. She became a young woman at exactly the right time to be used in God's redemptive plan. Only God knew what was coming and what needed to happen. Make no mistake, God was directing the actions of this story. Behind the scenes, God was setting the stage in the ways of Haman and Esther couldn't even have imagined. And it seems like there's a lot of coincidence in the story. Esther just happened to be the right age. Esther just happened to be super hot, right? Mordecai just happened to overhear a plot about the king that would end up saving his life. The king just happened to have insomnia that night. All of these things, all of these things seem like coincidence, but under them you see the movement of God. This story is just an example of how at one crucial moment in history, the promises of God are fulfilled, not by miraculous intervention, but through completely ordinary events. Maybe you feel like your own life is no more than a series of meaningless events that just happen. And we may not see the pattern of our own lives, but just as in the story of Esther, God is always directing things behind the scenes. We see the written story, but God is at work in the unseen and the unwritten. God works in our lives in seemingly meaningless events. Consider the events that led to your salvation. Consider the events that led you to be in church today. Many insignificant events chain together to create a life-changing thing, right? And that's how God works. Not always in the miraculous and the big and the saving people from a fiery furnace, saving people from the jaws of the lions, but in the little things, in the moments, in the ordinary. God is sovereign. God is at work. Every event in history is tied to the redemptive history of God. And God will accomplish what God intends to accomplish, regardless of our involvement. God would have delivered, and Mordecai tells Esther this, God would have delivered his people one way or the other. Right? With Esther's help or without. And it's the same in our own lives. God will accomplish what God intends to accomplish. Whether we choose to be a part of it or not. Do you think that you can thwart God's plans? And I don't mean that in a way of who do you think you are. I mean that to say we feel like sometimes we screw up. And maybe we've ruined an opportunity. Maybe we've ruined God being able to work. Do you think you can ruin God's plan? God will still accomplish what God intends to accomplish. Sometimes because of us, and sometimes in spite of us. The book of Esther may not directly mention God, and yet God is clearly at work throughout the story. God's not, name is not written in the book, but God's fingerprints are all over it. The coincidences, the amazing reversals, the poetic justice that led to the deliverance of the Jews all proclaim the presence of God. So is this a story that continues to be relevant to us as Christians? Is this just a Christian story, or is it an Old Testament moral tale? What are the similarities between Esther's situation and ours? Esther lived in a world where God 
was not followed or known or honored. Right? And in that sense, the world we live in is very similar. She lived in a time when God's people were waiting for redemption. They were in a foreign land, a land where they didn't belong, far from Israel, waiting for God to come and take them home. Peter in the New Testament describes us as aliens and exiles, people with no real home in the place where we live, waiting for the day when God will come and take us to receive the inheritance we've been waiting for. And someday we will see our lives from the vantage point of God's purposes. And we'll understand the promise of Ephesians 2 that says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So as we live faithfully, whatever happens, the decisions we make, the mistakes we regret, even the sins that shame us, they are all links in God's timeline. They may not have been the original plan, but they become part of our history and part of our journey to God. So will we be like Esther and step out in faith to do what God has called us to do? Esther was able to absolutely surrender her will to God and have the courage to say, if I perish, I perish. And we also need to trust God and surrender to God's will. We have to come to a point where we can confess, I will be true to God, and if I perish, I perish. God will continue to be God. And God's work will continue to be done. But church, we have a choice whether we want to be a part of it or whether we will choose to sit out. And Esther chose to be a part of God's work. And while I may not love this story, this is a story of how God works. And God's ways will be the way that it happens. And Esther was a part of it. Will we be a part of it too? The team's going to come.